Caution, the Mark Unger Show contains adult content intended for an adult audience. And, besides that, he's really weird. Welcome to the Mark Gunger Show with international marriage speaker and author of Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, Mark Gunger. This is your source for practical, down-to-earth marriage advice without all the over-spiritualization or romantic nonsense. And now the host of the Mark Gunger Show, Mark Gunger. And the crowd goes wild with delirious joy. They've joined the Mark Gunger Show, the show that deals with all things concerning... Marriage. Marriage. Indeed, I'm your host, the one, the only Mark Gunger. Joining me, as always, the ever-lovely and charming Diane. Philip James Gunger is a slacker today on this week's show. <laughs> He's Notice not... I'm always here. You're always here. I'm always here. That's right. Like, I'm never a slacker. There's never an empty chair. Oh, yeah, guess what? Because we couldn't do the show. If That's what was. my wife and I always say. She's always here. Yeah. Oh, for the love of heaven. She's always here. Anyway, engineering the show is always very talented, but eerily creepy. Timothy Robert Ray, pushing buttons, twisting knobs, and trying to stay awake during this, during this incomprehensibly, immeasurably boring show. This is the show that handles your marital challenges, relational conundrums, and dating dilemmas that you can email to us at ask, ASK, at Mark. Gungor.com. This is the show that answers, answers your relationship emails. What do you got today? Seven marriage mistakes even smart couples make. Okay. The first one, splitting the housework 50-50. I agree. That's it should be 100 nothing. <laughs> They say, this is often considered the fairest way to split the chores, whether it's washing the dishes or walking the dog, but aiming for 50-50 means you're constantly keeping score, Mm -hmm. making sure neither of you is getting the short end of the stick and bickering every time you think you are. Spend too much time fixating on fairness today, and you risk not making it in the long run when things often balance out. They say better to use a system where you do what you're good at, and she does what she's good at. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're absolutely dead on there. By the way, have you noticed how many psycho crazy people <laughs> on our Facebook <laughs> make yes. comments? I mean, if I make a one comment about a man, they'll say, what about women? Yep. And if I say something about women yeah. loving their husbands, what about men? Yeah. You know, uh, I was like, your book, treat them like a dog. They all want you to write the reverse book about how he's supposed to treat her. What about how to treat women? You know what that is? It's a sign of this politically correct nonsense and insanity everybody has. Everything has to be fair. Everything has to be fair at all times. You can't say one thing without saying about the other. I mean, you're all crazy. If you think this way, y'all need to check your medication or you need to be medicated. For heaven's sakes, that is not life. I thought it was a sign of being extraordinarily immature and acting like a child. Yes, that's that how, as well. That's how second and third graders are, fourth graders. But that's what they've done to our culture. They've done the whole culture that we all act like children now. Well, it's not fair. What's fair? What's it's got to be fair. It's not fair. It's got to be totally balanced. And everything's just good grief. It just irritates me to no end. And people go like into marriage like this, 50-50. And everything has to be done yeah. exactly. And these are the people who are always at each other's throats. Yeah. I just thank God I didn't marry a woman like that. Oh. When people post those things on your Facebook, you know, I'd be you writing, have, how to laugh your way to a better divorce. You have the like and all those little buttons. Yeah. I wish that they had a slap emoji button that I could press. <laughs> when people post stuff like that, I just want to press the slap button. I know. Like, it's smack you. Stop that. It's not fair. Why don't, why don't you say this about men? No. It could be anything. Uh, it's any it's comment, whether you anything. do a joke, a one-liner, a funny picture, anything. Just unreal. What about men? What about women? What I about know, this? I, what I about just that? Ignore them. They're just. It's very annoying. Children. Very annoying. Grown, it's very immature. Overweight children. Yes. Just do what right. you're good at. In do some what cases, you're good at. you well, might be better at 100 percent of the things, so you're stuck doing 100 percent of the things. Maybe. And this the whole thing goes with you know submission and everything. You know who should do the leader though should. Just whoever is the best at something should do it, straight up. It's Except, you know matter. what? I have been told, now, yes. I don't know if this is true, but I have been told that many all you men will 
not it be good at something intentionally just so you don't have to do it again. Is that true? Is there any truth to that rumor? I, I if I no screw it up or if I don't do it the right way, then she's not going to ask me to do it again. Uh, Is that true? Anything's possible. <laughs> All things are, are possible. Pleading the fifth on that. <laughs> no, it's, who knows? I mean, people are motivated by different things. What I do know is, uh, we've talked about this before. The women who ask their husband to do something and constantly criticize him when he yes. doesn't do it exactly the same way. Yeah. So some guys who are married to women like this know that all they got to do is mess up and yes. just say, "Never mind, I'll do it myself." Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that people. Yeah. Would so think it's that like, way. okay, fine. But, but that's on the girl. What, women putting, do that to putting, their kids, though, too. Huh? It's like they they want their kids to fold the towels the right way and do this the right oh, way. No, totally and they correct their kids. And so then the kids, the same way the husbands, they don't want to do and, it and, anymore because mom's just going to go crazy. Yeah, and, and no wonder she's so stressed out. Yeah. So, so nobody will help you. No, it's not that nobody will help you. Because you're such a perfectionist. Everybody has to help you exactly the right way. Y'all yeah. need to chill out a bit. Yeah. Goodness gracious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, anyway. Okay, the second mistake is waiting until you're in the mood to have sex. All right, I preach that for a long time. But you don't have to wait until you're in the mood to do it. People who do it just need do to it do it. Do it on purpose. All right. Um, uh, number three, assuming a rough patch is the end of the world. Relationships go in cycles. There are ups and downs, just like in the economy. They're not only inevitable, but they're actually healthy. They force you to see where you've let things slide, taking each other for granted, or just lost sight of what's important. That is very true. So the bottom is not falling out. It's not the end of the world. If you have a disagreement, if there's troubles and stresses and... You know, even if my wife and I hit a really rough patch, and we do, just like everybody else, we don't panic. Mm-hmm. We don't freak. Nobody's going anywhere. Even if it's intense and crazy, you know? So, but people haven't learned this. Well, they time. think that there's something wrong with the relationship and that it's not fixable and that that must mean that they're not compatible or they're not meant for each other. Yeah. All sorts of crazy things. Or I don't want to have to live like this. I want to be happy. And assorted versions of crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, then so then people who do that and then get divorced and they marry somebody else and guess what? Same things happen. The same thing happens. It's not like... Anyway, all right. Uh, we'll do one more, then we can save the other half. Uh, number four, staying up to resolve an argument, even if it takes all night, is a I, bad idea. Now, there's some people who would say that's a good idea, but I would agree with this person. I think it is a bad yes. idea. Everything doesn't have to be resolved right now. Yeah, because sometimes you a, can... Just breathe a little bit. We'll pick it up tomorrow. You know, don't have to be... We got it, because they'll say, you know, don't, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, that mm-hmm. whole thing. Well, that's the argument of having an argument at night, because you got till the next day before the sun goes back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes when you've just talked it to death and you're overtired and everything else, nothing good can come of that. Just start over again with a clear perspective. <laughs> what are you looking for? Nothing. Ignore oh. me. <laughs> you're not looking for something. You're Ignore just me. on your computer. No, I heard a beep. But I was saying, oh, okay. Did you hear that beep? I did hear it. What was that? I don't know. I don't know. hear beeps. I did hear it. Like, where's the beep? <laughs> Why? Why hear, is it beeping? When you hear the beep, what is happening? It's the beeps. So I don't know. Okay. What the heck? Yeah, yeah I, think I, so. I heard it, but I didn't know I what it was. I my computer, but I don't know why. Okay. Anyway, so be it. There you are. We'll continue the last three marriage mistakes next time. All right. Okay. Sounds good. All right, we'll take a break. Be back with your emails. Emails right after this. Download your free Mark Gunger app today to see all of the latest from the world of Mark Gunger. We're back at the Mark Gunger Show. Mark Gunger and the lovely Diane. Phil is absent on today's, this week's show. What do you got? Uh, He says, I'm a 38-year-old married man with two kids. I grew up in the church, a preacher's son. In addition, my wife and I are regular listeners of your show and sermons. I know the difference between right and wrong, yet I still have a porn problem that seems to rotate on a nine-month cycle. I think I figured out the reason, or a good part of it at least, apathy. There are a great many things in my life that I just do not care about, and a handful of others that I only care about because I need to take care of my family. Do you have any advice on how someone can dig their way out of apathy. <laughs> I've never even thought about that. Yeah, I suppose 
you're going to have a problem with porn if you don't care. It's like you have don't you have a problem with running over people in your car if you don't care. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with stealing stuff if I don't care. I mean, uh, how do you fix that? I don't care. I don't know. I suppose if the consequences are high enough, you begin to care. I, yeah, yeah. That's why you don't run over people. Yeah. That's actually that is true. The problem with this porn thing is not that people can't control themselves. There's no consequences for it, so they give into it all the time. So I don't know. I think you just need to look at the potential negative consequences, uh, and how bad of a problem is this for them? Is it a major problem? Well, One thing for sure: people who look at porn, guys who look at porn, it ruins their sex lives overwhelmingly. That's the number one reason you'd think everybody would avoid it. Mm-hmm. And even secular people are saying this. In fact, more secular people are saying it than Christian people are saying it. So secular people now, there's a huge movement among secular people to turn down porn for men who've testified this has destroyed my sex life. And they're speaking a big time. Time Magazine had a whole cover on it not too many months ago. So if you knew it was going to destroy your sex life, would that make you care enough to knock it off? It would me. I don't want to write my sex life. These guys do that, and it drops their testosterone level. The fastest way you can drop your testosterone levels is to masturbate. Men who masturbate a lot, uh, psychologists, we read about this years ago. Mm-hmm. They lose their confidence. They're mm-hmm. physically dragging. Their, their voices change. Mm-hmm. They raise. Because it's actually a result of not having mm-hmm. testosterone. These guys, they, 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 uh, they're afraid to look at people in the eye like some little prepubescent boy. Mm-hmm. And then when they stop and heal, all of a sudden... Their testosterone levels pop back up again. Mm -hmm. Their voice deepens. They have more energy, more willing to connect with people and succeed more in life. Testosterone is a big deal for men. You want to mess with your testosterone? Masturbate and drop it and see how much your life stinks. So it's very possible this guy just doesn't know. You know, you and I were going to write on this book Mm -hmm. about uh, the whole masturbation thing. Mm -hmm. But there was a breakdown of communication. Mm -hmm. You had a whole thing about Mm -hmm. what I wanted is just the studies. Mm-hmm. Chapter one, the study says, you know, can, prostate cancers, uh, ER, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Erectile dysfunction. <laughs> ER. Yeah. ED. ED. They're not ER, they're emergency. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I couldn't get it. ED. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, testosterone level problems. I mean, the, there's so many studies that have come out recently. Boom, 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 boom. And I just wanted to line. I wanted the first opening chapter would be my salvo, one or the other about it, and then maybe wrap it up at the end. But the middle, I just want it filled with boom, 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 Mm -hmm. and just show them the studies, show them the studies, show them the studies, show them the studies. I think if guys actually saw the cost that this would be to them, Mm -hmm. it would start to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And in his mind, there is no cost, because that's what everybody thinks. Well, nobody, nobody, it doesn't matter. If I do it, it's no big, I shouldn't, yeah, I suppose, naughty me, but there's no, for example, if we cut off your toe, one of your toes, every time you Mm -hmm. masturbated and looked at porn, I bet you'd stop. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. The reason they say they can't stop or they relapse every now is because they don't think there's anything wrong with it, other than morally. But see, no, even that. See, he's a pr- preacher's kid. Yeah, he said just he knows knowing between right morally and wrong. Uh, is not good. It's still not enough to make a person stop. They have to actually see how much this actually physically damages them and psychologically damages them. They get that picture, they would stop. And that's where obviously we got sidetracked. We well, we didn't five books this year. What's wrong with us? You know. So we've had our hands full, but at some point, I'd still like to go back. It would be nice to have something like that where we just pull back the curtains and say, this is what you're looking at when you do this. But uh, even knowing that that's the consequence for it, unless they experience that consequence themselves, do you think that it acts as a deterrent? You know, it's like how many people yeah, do not it, no, know that does. smoking causes lung cancer or all sorts of other things, but yet people do it. Yeah, but a smaller percentage. I mean, a vast majority of people have stopped smoking. And there's anti-smoking signs everywhere. It's all because of getting this idea that this could that, kill that you. That it could hurt you. And hurt you. It doesn't. There's always people who are going to do anything, you know. But once people really get a picture in their head, this will hurt me. Nobody wants to be hurt. No one wants to suffer loss. Okay? Everything that drives pretty much human behavior is either... Uh, the benefit of gain or the fear of loss. Okay, so in the realm of pornography, that was the next thought I had. What There's a win in there somewhere for these guys that they keep doing it. So what do they think is the win? Just well, the they get a sexual release and they, they don't feel uh, as jacked up, you know. But even that is pathetic. And there's studies there that mm-hmm. it's not a real orgasm. 
and that they have to keep doing it over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. See, a guy gets all jacked up. He wants to have sex. And he wants to mess with his wife, and he's tired, and he doesn't want to have to go through whatever because he's lazy. So he masturbates to relieve himself. But it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. And your body will come screaming right back for more of it again because it's not satisfying. Mm-hmm. Because, as I said, we could show in the studies, it's not actual sex. It's an artificial pathetic version of sex so once people get that in there and i promise you teenagers who get this in there's not a teenage boy on earth who wants to run the risk of ruining his sex life it's too precious to us you see and that i don't believe well, i think that I they're too impulsive extreme. i think no. that they just no i i don't think that no. that would matter that seems too far down the road no, to no, them no. i don't think they have no the it's not radar, no because it's honestly. not too far down because these boys in like in the time magazine thing so they were 19 years old and they couldn't have sex with girls they were 18 years old. They couldn't have sex with girls. These teenagers, I'm not even talking from a moral standpoint. I'm just talking regular teenagers. Yeah. They expect to have sex. Well, it's a ASAP. big deal when, once you find yourself in that place. But I'm saying to a 15-year-old guy to hear this, oh, it'll wreck your sex life, I don't think they have the forward radar, most of them. They no. think that won't happen to me. No, I think you're wrong. No, <laughs> I, think you're, no I do. I, they, the thing is, is they're hearing the exact opposite. They're hearing this is normal, this is good, everybody does it. They take all the benefits and studies of showing how sex is good for you and apply it to masturbation. I've seen stuff yeah. printed in high school manuals. Well, that's you what know, I mean. People they- who, have, who masturbate live longer, have it. That, they're taking the studies from sex, not masturbating. Masturbating does not equal no. the same thing. And I think if a, because that's what you're fighting against. Once they get a picture of, hey, this can mess you up, this can jack with you, you're not going to be able to function. You know, nobody wants to mess saying. with that. I don't think that, that that's a loud enough and it's out there enough message that the it's little It's not out there at all. Voice, Who hears, that's what I mean. It's like I'm for the only guy I know who ever talks about this. And then I see these studies every once in a while. This, this Time Magazine thing was shocking to me. How yeah. long have I been screaming about that? Yeah. I've been yelling about this for 15 years. Yeah. Everybody mocked me. Even Christians mocked me. Yeah. In the beginning, everybody. Because they didn't have any studies. Yeah. Well, now you they need have a the study. Studies. Now the studies are roaring in. And I'm going, hello, who was yelling this? So hardly anybody hears this today. That's why the book, I think, would be helpful, especially to Christian parents who want to get it to their boys. And we can write it in such a way that it needs to be written to a 14-year-old boy, and they need to see the risk. They get the picture of the risk. Now, you're saying, well, there's no guarantee that'll happen to everybody. Okay, but most guys don't want to take that risk. Most guys don't want, if you blindfold yourself and walk across the streets, chances are you won't get run over by a car. Most guys won't do it. Why? Because there's a chance yeah. you'll get run over by a car. So anyway. Yeah. All right. Before I run over her, let's take a break and be back with more right after this. Have a marriage dilemma? Email your questions to ask at markgunger.com and Mark can answer them during one of our shows. Back on the Mark Gunger Show, grooving to the music of Jimmy Bratcher. What do you got? She says, my husband and I have been married for five years. Last week, I received a message from my husband's ex-fiance's husband. So at one point, this lady's husband got was it. engaged, and then she's not married. Okay. And that husband said that my husband had been talking to and meeting up with this woman, which was his ex, <laughs> the last few weeks. Okay. And that he told her that he loved her and couldn't imagine his life without her. Uh-huh. She says, I was devastated. My husband confirmed that it was true, and when he came home to talk to me, he was so cold and distant. I felt like I didn't even know him. We have two little ones. I can't imagine them going through life with a broken family. The kids and I left and have been at my mom's house for a week and a half. I Dad. talked to my husband one other time, and he said he doesn't know if he's done with the ex, and I asked him if things got better with our marriage, if he would want our family back. He said yes, but he really doesn't think things will ever get better. I told him that we have never tried. He said he just needs some time and space, so we haven't talked other than the pickup arrangements with the kids in a week. I just feel like I need to be fighting for our marriage, but I have no idea where his head is at. It sucks just sitting here waiting, but I know if I try to contact him, he will see it as me being pushy. I just wish there was a way to wake him up. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Okay. 
at the beginning, what was the first thing? He came home and he seemed distant. Mm-hmm. That was his, her response. Just cold and distant. Cold and distant. Mm-hmm. Why does she even care what his response is? So he was cold I, and distant towards her. No, no, no. You don't understand it. She finds out mm-hmm. that he is virtually screwing around with some other guy's wife, an ex-girlfriend. She knows he knows. He comes home, and what's she write? He was cold and distant. He wasn't apologetic. He wasn't concerned about their marriage. He wasn't all of that. That's what no, 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 I no. believe she's saying. You're still, not miss- you're still missing it. You're married, happily married. You think everything's great. You find out he is trying to hook up with an old girlfriend. When he comes home, what's likely to happen? Well, it will hit the fan. Yeah. You would be the one. Dealing and setting the temperature with what's going yes. on. Yeah. My concern is you read her email, he comes home and he sets the temperature. Yes. He's cold and he's distant. Really? Because it's, she's fearful. Exactly. He's not, exactly. He's not right. acting contrite. He's not acting sorry. He's not acting concerned. And it's scaring the she, willies out of her. She's the one who's afraid. Yes. She's the one. She should be the one throttling him, yeah. for heaven's sakes. Yeah. But right away, as an alarm goes off in my head when I hear her write this, because what happens is she calls him on as this is bad. He ought to be walking in fear of his wife coming home and, and answering to this. When he comes, she's describing how he was cold. Really? Colin, this, you shouldn't even notice what he was. You should have been laying down the law. This is unacceptable. We don't do this. You can't be cheating. Blah, 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 blah. Grab the kids. Get the heck out. At least you were smart about that. Mm-hmm. But now her fear is, she's constantly fear-driven. Mm-hmm. You know, what if he does this? And what if this? Look, I get that you want to fight for your marriage, and that's a good thing. It's an admirable thing. But this is on him. It's all on him. Okay? You lay down the law. You don't do this. We don't tolerate this. Straight up. Uh, you said I don't want to be divorced. I know, but it's... You know, I don't want to pay bills. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to pay taxes. I do all kinds of stuff. There's some things in life that are forced on you. Marriage is an odd thing because and that's why God is so intense about it. And it's one of the top ten. Do not commit adultery. It is very damaging and hurtful. She's describing, gee, it's so awful. Yes. That's why you're not supposed to. That's why he's not supposed to do that. If you're going to be faithful and true to somebody and they refuse to be faithful and true to you, quite frankly, there's little to nothing you can do about it. And it is the ultimate number one reason, the only reason, quite frankly, that Jesus mentions for divorce. So it is what it is. Now, you want to wait him out and see if he's going to come to a sense is great. But don't you cave into him and don't you be afraid of what he's going to go through. God will help you through it. You're doing the right thing. Caution. The Mark Hunger Show contains adult content intended for an adult audience. Your We're back on the Mark Unger Show. I'm trying to tell guys here that one of the best ways you can get your kid to be normal is be really weird, and then your kids will grow up and rebel. Yeah, and sometimes <laughs> that don't work. Sometimes that don't work. Just so saying. if you're really normal, if you're really, really, really odd, your kids will grow up and they'll rebel against you and become normal. See what I'm saying? There's a plan. Yeah. yeah. There's a plan here. So, sometimes works. if you're it really, works. really weird, your kids are really, really weird and jacked up. <laughs> <laughs> so this last email, what I was trying to get at is this lady mm-hmm. finds out her husband's being unfaithful to her what, to whatever level. Yes. And when he comes home, she's more convinced or concerned about his demeanor as being cold and distant. Mm-hmm. That's dysfunction. It is dysfunction because a healthy person wouldn't even notice his demeanor. It wouldn't matter. There would be hell to pay upon finding out that you're being unfaithful to your spouse. Now, why that isn't happening, I don't know. But at least I give her all the kudos in the world. She's not sticking around. She took the kids and got the heck out of there. So good for her. But you don't need to be worried about his demeanor. And don't be right. Well, gee, if our marriage gets better when you come home, don't be begging him. Don't be begging him. No, that's what I'm fighting for. That's not fighting for your marriage. That's sounding pathetic. And he knows it sounds pathetic. And it makes you just go quiet on him. At some point, you just keep praying God will get a hold of his heart and head. At some point, he realizes, you know, gee, I miss my kids, and I kind of miss my wife because she used to do this and this, and she doesn't do it anymore. And who knows what that other, there's no guarantee that other chick's going to leave her husband and go off to him. Mm-hmm. These things rarely turn out well. So you don't be begging him if things get better. This isn't about you, it's about him. Listen, things can be wonderful in your home, and a guy can be taken off and go in the wrong direction. It can happen to anybody. It's not about you. All of this is about him. All right? Don't be worrying about his demeanor 
and don't be begging him to come home. Gee, if things get better and all this, just don't do that. It's all signs of weakness. Everything she's mentioned in this email, other than, because I'm she shocked she did the right thing. The parents. I'm shocked she did the right thing. This is good because everything else about her screams weakness. But she had enough composure to get those kids and go to her parents. Mm -hmm. That's what you do, and stop showing weakness to this guy. This is not anything about you. It's all on him, and he needs to pay the price for it. And he needs to do the, do the math. I don't know how long have they been married, did they say? Did she say? And this only happened a week and a half ago. Five years they've been married. Five, five years. years. At some point they have assets that's going to be split up. Mm -hmm. You know, divorce is expensive. It's a painful deal. It's mm -hmm. no cheap deal. And I would, I would be, I would try, if you go for the divorce, I would try to take every penny. <laughs> Not Here's in a mean, what I would say. Wait a minute. Okay. Let me finish up. Not mm -hmm. to be mean and nasty. I'm just saying they need to pay a price for this. Right now he's not doing the math. Don't be begging him anything. He needs to know this is going to cost him in so many ways. And he would maybe not have as much access to his children. And all that stuff affects people in a big, big way. All right. You may contradict me now. I'm not contradicting oh. you. This is what I would say. A week and a half into this ordeal, and for anybody who, whether it's a full-blown affair or whatever, do not start making sweeping decisions about seeing lawyers, about whether you're going to save it, about whether you're going to dump him, because in the height of all of the emotion, you're not thinking clearly. And to make rash decisions I based on that. emotion is silly and foolish. Yes, go to your parents, separate Absolutely. and get out of there, and let it breathe. Go and let silent. It Don't be begging him. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Go silent. He needs to know this is going to cost him at yes. some point. I wouldn't rush off and see anybody either. I wouldn't no. go to attorneys and stuff like that. He needs, this needs to hit the fan. And why even plays out with the other girl? Because yeah. the chances of her leaving her husband yeah. is likely not going to happen. At some point, he's going to realize he now has nothing. You just need to get quiet, yeah. give it some space. He needs to realize, and if it does start going to that, he needs to know, hey, this is going to cost you big time. I'm going to try and get every penny I possibly can out of this deal, and you're going to have limited access to your children. This is the stuff he needs to start paying. I wouldn't be even dealing with that at this point. At this point, I'm concerned that she is talking to him and saying things like, well, why do things got better? Well, that's what I'm saying. Do not make the decision to leave and see lawyers, but also do not make the decision, oh, we got to stay, we got to make this work. You can't make a decision like that either way in the height of the emotion and in the initial blow up of a situation like that. You have to just let it play out. But you don't. Call him. No, that's what I'm saying. And say. That's what I'm saying. What if I make it that, better? Did you listen to what I said? That's what I just said. <laughs> don't make decisions about trying to make it work and begging him to come back. Don't do that. Oh, don't do begging. any of it. You weren't doing that. You didn't say the begging. You did About say, trying to make it tape. work out. Pay back the tape. I didn't say begging, but it was all the part of the same conversation. I get it. I'm not having a problem with your conversation. I'm saying don't be begging him. To come back. That's absurd. And don't be begging, gee, if things got better. Don't do that. That's what I'm saying. Don't, don't even make the decision what you want that you want to make this work. Don't make any decisions about anything. Just leave it. Just people, leave it. People can't do it. They cannot do Just it. Just leave it. I'll be, I'll, I was, uh, every once in a while, I'll deal with a couple that's an absolute crisis. And they're coming unglued. I say, okay, this is what we're going to do. For the next 60 to 90 days, we'll set our time, whatever it is, we're not going to do anything. They can't handle no it. No one's not going to do anything. And they just can't no. handle it. Well, say six days. Just don't even they, go 60. Go they, six. They, they and can't. they can't handle We have to talk about it. We have I, to fix it. We have to do something. I know they it. can't handle it. And it only makes it worse. You just leave it. it. On, they can't do it. No. And I tell them, this is what I'm, I'm going to advise you what to do, but you will not listen to me. No, I will. You won't. I know you won't. I just had a couple, a couple like this recently. Because the unsettled part of it, they need to make a decision I one way or another. I just had this conversation with a couple. Go with this. I'm telling you, I'm going to advise you what to do. Because Baz will help. Okay, I'm going to tell you what to do. But you won't listen to me. Yeah, well, no, you won't. And I told them this. And it was a matter of days. And they coming off unglued and trying to talk. And it's, they don't listen. They just don't listen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the best thing is not to do anything, which is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And don't be begging him or anything else. Mm -hmm. Just go silent on the deal. Mm -hmm. But they can't do it. I don't know. But man, don't be begging this guy. Ugh. This is not about you. It's not about your marriage. It's not. It's all about him. She takes it as a referendum that maybe I did something wrong. Don't do that. If you did something wrong, they need you to lead with that. 
Say I'm, that again. If they're if they're doing something bad because of something you do, they'll lead with that. They'll say, "Well, I did this because you yeah. did this," or you know. But don't don't be well. Some, that that's out. not even true. And even that's not true. All right. That's just not even true. All right. Okay. He says, "My wife and I have had major problems and stresses over the past two to three years. After an almost complete marriage breakdown, it was by God's grace our marriage was saved. But cleaning up the mess has been difficult. I want our house to be in order, but we are a chaotic mess. This is topped off." Pretty uh, by pretty chaotic family issues around us, which tend to pull us into. My wife is constantly on edge and stressed, and I go to my nothing box. But she needs me to be strong, and my nothing box had made has made me a lazy and a procrastinator. I don't want to be this way. My heart and focus is on Christ, but when it comes to even godly disciplines, I try to do much that I, and so much I'm an unorganized mess and end up doing very little. My wife is always coming to me with so many problems and doesn't want to talk about solutions. Solutions. This also leads me to shut down. My real question, I suppose, is how to restore order among the chaos. But he thinks his nothing box is becoming the problem and trying to deal with the issues and problems with his wife. I don't know. What are the issues and problems with his wife? I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't. It's like it's like going to a doctor and say, "I have this pain, and I can't take it anymore. And uh, what can I do?" What kind of pain is it? <laughs> I think the pain is because I, I don't exercise enough. O- okay. What is the pain? So I don't know. Well, I, I think my problem is my nothing box. He describes all the... If it's without- nothing box and he shuts down and doesn't want to deal with her, I didn't think that what the particular issues were were relevant. Otherwise, I would have asked. I oh, just, no, I just... What do you want me to say? That's men's go-to thing. Quit thinking about stuff. That's how we handle stress. I get it. He says he. Didn't I thought like you it. had a more general answer to it that you didn't need the specifics to the problem. No, I mean I don't know. I, I like to go to my nothing box. I know I like to not get out of bed in the morning, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he still got to do it. Mm-hmm. Just because the guy likes to do and is a default mode to go to the nothing box to do, to clear his head and think about nothing is that's how men handle stress. He's in stress. That's how he handles stress. Well, he says it's made him lazy and a procrastinator. No, no, no. He is lazy and a procrastinator. Is nothing box it make. <laughs> See, this is why I didn't bother to... You had the answer. The problems were irrelevant. What the specific problems were, were irrelevant. Uh, yeah. Well, That's why I didn't whatever. ask. Because then we're down 25 different rabbit trails. But even still, I mean, what is the problem? I don't know what his problem is. I don't know. People, you know, people, they go all over the place. Talk about He's undisciplined trails. and unorganized. And they... Says who? Says him. But... Uh, and I'd ask questions about that. What you have no idea how many times I'll talk to a guy and say he'll come in because he's beat. He's been beat, and I don't know this. I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm not picking on ladies or this lady. I have no. I know one guy in my mind right now who his wife just abuses him and beats the snot out of him. So he emotionally, comes, and he comes to me and says, "You know, I know it's my fault, and and I what can I do?" And I go, "What's your fault?" Well, I'm a this and a, who says you're a this and that. What, because he's not a this or that at all. So that's why I'm saying I can't, if I were talking to this guy, I wouldn't get two senses, sentences into this and make any sense. I'd start changing it to details. What are you talking about? I'm lazy. And, well, what do you mean you're lazy? Who said you're lazy? Well, my wife tells me I'm lazy. Do you feel you're lazy? No, not really, but she tells me. <laughs> so I don't know. Listen, not all abuse is done by men, by any stretch of the no, imagination. No. And I'm not saying this guy may not be abused at all. He might be exactly what he says, mm-hmm. a lazy, good-for-nothing guy who doesn't, well, then stop. Mm-hmm. You need an analysis for this? If you know you're lazy and stuff, stop being lazy. You want to save your marriage? You want to fix it? Or you want to stay miserable? I don't understand that. It's like, you know, it hurts when I do this. Well, stop doing that. (laughs) So I don't know. If procrastination causes you more problems, if ignoring the conversations with your wife and dealing with the issues causes more problems, stop it. (laughs) Deal with your wife. Do you think? Have the conversations. Suck it up, buttercup, and do what you need to do. I mean, is this it? is clearly detrimental to your marriage and your life. Well, then don't do then what's don't do clearly that. detrimental to your life. But what he's trying to say is because he's heard my seminar, I think, well, it's, it's the nothing box making me do this mm-hmm. way. No. <laughs> a nothing box is just a way man handles stress. If you're a lazy bum, you're a lazy bum. My question is, is he in fact a lazy bum? Who told you? You admit it? No one's ever told you that. that you know, if he's uh, you know, been pounded into a, a view that's what he is. You know, and maybe he really is. In which case, then stop it. Mm-hmm. Look, it's like someone who goes to has never has any money, never has any money, never any cry. I have no money. Well, do you have a job? No. Why did you get a job? Well, I don't know. I like to watch TV. Well, I don't have an answer for that. You need to get a job. 
If this guy's life stinks because he's a lazy procrastinator, then stop it. Well, I don't want to. Well, do you like the way your life is? At some point, you pay a price enough that you change. So, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, let's take a break. I need a break because I'm a lazy procrastinator. We'll be back right after this. Attend Mark's Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage event. Visit LaughYourWay.com for upcoming dates and locations. I remember the first time I crossed that bridge. We're back on the Mark Unger Show. Answer me emails about love, marriage, and relationships. What do you got? She says, I'm a Christian married to an unbeliever. Okay. My husband was released from prison last year, and within five months of his release was addicted to methamphetamine. He lives with his parents, who super enable his behavior and have no idea that he's a drug addict. None of these people are Christians. The issue is, I don't think I can divorce him. I rarely see or hear from him. I don't give him any money or enable his behavior, but he refuses to divorce me, saying that he knows his behavior is wrong, but that he doesn't want to get off drugs yet and can't stand the thought of me being gone forever. In other words, he wants me to wait. I won't divorce him because I refuse to walk away from my vows. I'm seeking God and hear nothing. I have many confirmations that I'm supposed to stand and wait for restoration, but another Christian is telling me that God doesn't mean for me to exist in a no man's land for the rest of my life waiting for him. In the meantime, I saw the movie The War Room, and to be honest, fighting for a marriage just isn't that easy. I don't know what to do anymore. Thanks for your insight. Well... You know, people, they just don't understand human behavior. He says he doesn't want her to divorce him. Uh, but he wants to keep doing the drugs. She needs to tell him, well, I'm going to divorce you if you don't stop doing the drugs. Now, she might not ever divorce him at all mm-hmm. and do all the stuff that she's talking about. But when you basically concede to him up front, what's his motivation to change? Yeah. Right? He doesn't want... Find out what they want and what they don't want. Use it to your advantage to affect people's behavior. I don't want it. I don't, I don't want a divorce. Don't, listen, I'm going to the courthouse in three days to meet with an attorney to file a divorce. I don't want it. Well, then you need to, whatever. You need to go in for treatment or you need, mm-hmm. you force the, find out what they want and use it for your leverage. Why is she giving him, taking away all his leverage? I don't understand that. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. All right, good. I wasn't sure it made sense in my own head. If the last thing he wants is to be divorced... Then you tell him you're going to divorce him. Which until, is... If, he's, if he doesn't change, <laughs> tell him it. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to... Well, it doesn't matter what you want to do. It doesn't, you may never do it. It's like, you never tell your kids that if you don't do such and such, I'm going to take away your pony and turn it into dog meat. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have no intention of taking the pony and turning it into dog meat. But you get the kids' attention. No, 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 my boat. Then stop smacking your sister in the head. Does not make any sense? Yeah, I think that's horrible. <laughs> I think that's a horrible analogy. I think it's brilliant. I know. I <laughs> think it's horrible. I'm going to smack you upside the head. Now, she may not have no intention of ever smacking you upside I'm the head. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I'm going to take away your... She had, the parent has no intention of taking away their whatever. There's that beating Yeah, again. I did hear it again. I don't know what that is. We're all hallucinating here. No. So, I, I don't... I would say... I He... I, I don't want this. Well, I'm going to give this to you if you don't, and you got to come up with whatever you need him to do. Yeah. Go get help. You need to quit. You need to go in for, uh, what do you call it? Uh, treatment. Uh, treatment. Like, I'm going to file these papers. If you, and I'd, you, you might even get the papers and mail them to him with having no intention of signing it yourself. You don't have to violate your conscience. You just use things to have influence on people. Send him the papers from the attorney. You're going, I don't want a divorce. I don't. I just, I just, blah, blah. If you don't go over for treatment, if you go for treatment, I'll tear this up. Okay. You, so it's amazing what you can get people to do once you find out what they want. Use some creative thinking to try and change the behavior. And if you don't, I'm going to take your pony and I'm going to chop it up into dog meat. We'll be back with more right after this. Want more of Mark? Visit markgunger.com. There you will find everything that Mark has to offer. I require no invitation for quiet walks and rendezvous. My only expectation, please forgive me, is that you're with me. The music of Michael O'Brien. Check out his music, michaelo.org. Looking forward to performing with Michael. 
or be appearing with Michael end of October in Chattanooga, Tennessee. What do you got? A dating question. She says, how do I know if I'm ready to date again and remarry? She's 59 and been single for the past six years. She says, I grew up in an alcoholic home and all the dysfunction because I didn't know what I didn't know and thought I did. My two marriages didn't make it. My picker was obviously broken, and as a result, I was broken. I was a mess, got help and pressed into God with everything I had. He was there to help me and get whole again in unbelievable ways and still is. So now it's been six years, and the thought of meeting a good man is very appealing. But then again, it sometimes seems scary, but so does spending the rest of my life single. I have prayed about this, and for right now, God has told me to wait. He didn't say no or never. So I am just asking you for your thoughts on this based on all of your experience. Go to my website and download the ebook. You can read it on your computer, your Kindle, your iPhone, iPad, whatever. Being Found. It is a Christian woman's guide to marriage. I'll be able to answer the bulk of your questions. There's already several things you've said that, <laughs> that are problematic. But the easiest answer, one of the things I can say is if you want to get dating, you can just start dating. Say, well, I'm, I'm nervous. Well, yeah, it's all kind of a scary thing. Dating's a little scary, a little nerve-wracking, you know. People on their wedding night, or the night before their wedding night, they're usually terrified. <laughs> what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Why? Because it's serious stuff. But you don't, you don't have to be afraid, the fact that you're nervous or, or uh, whatever. The, the thing I would react to the most, though, is what is God told her what? Mm -hmm. God has told me to wait. He didn't say no or never. Yeah. I would challenge that. Look, I know God can speak to people and stuff, but all these people claim God gives them all these words and voices and stuff, but a lot of it is just, they're just thoughts going into your head. Honestly, you know, I just... God doesn't play the, the weird games and leave you all totally confused and whatever. Um, marriage is a choice. The Bible teaches it's a choice. Why would God tell you one thing or the other? I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's her faith. I, you can't mess with that because that's people's own personal faith. I just, mm -hmm. If I were your friend, I would challenge you and say, really? You know, they over-spiritualize everything. How do you know it was God? I know it wasn't some, your own thoughts flying in your head. How come you know the devil wants to throw it? Well, uh, my... She know my voice. Yeah, I get that, but exactly what he's talking about, I don't know. All I know, so many Christians. You know how many Christians tell me, you know, God told us to get married, and then six months later, God's telling me to get divorced, and just, you know, and God told me to get this job, and then God told me to quit this job, and then God told me to come to this church, and then God told me to leave this church because I didn't like the way that you preached this morning, and then God told me... Do we really think God's telling these people this stuff? I they don't do. Think so. No, I know. I just think they're delusional. They do. They I think, think that God's they, doing all of that. They have over-spiritualized every thought that comes into their head. You need to balance things out with the teaching of the scriptures. What scriptural basis would God just leave you hanging, you know, and tell you, what? What was it? God told her what? Again, not God to get has told me to wait. He to didn't wait. say no yeah. or never. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't think God told her that at all. That's my personal opinion. I know it's offensive to some people. I'm not judging. I'm, I'm just telling you, you want to honest know, I don't think God told her that at all. Well, that I asked again. her, and she explained a little bit of sort of a vision that she had. Because I'd ask her, how do you know that God told you that? Yeah, okay, so, so you're she asking, how sort do you of know? described this little vision that she believes okay, was so, so, from now, God. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. If you really had the certainty in your spirit of a vision that God told you, why are you emailing me? Good point. Why are you emailing me? Why are you emailing anybody? Why are you asking everything? If you know I'll, what was from God was from God, then the period. The reason they're done. still asking because they really don't know because mm -hmm. their spirit, the real spirit part of them and the Holy Spirit that is in them is trying to let them know, hello, wake up from your delusions, okay? Because well, I'll tell you, the times God has spoken, the problem is God isn't constantly rattling off instructions every five seconds mm -hmm. to people. But there are times when God will actually speak to you. And the times God has ever, God has ever spoken to me, I have never had to doubt anything. Because you know that you know that you know and you know her, okay? Mm -hmm. The fact that you're emailing me means you're still not sure. If God told you to wait, then what do you want? You want me to tell you not to wait? Well, I probably would because I don't think God told you that. But I'm just saying, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. These people, God told them something, then they asked for advice. Mm -hmm. Well, why are you asking me? Uh, I need advice. Why well, just do what God told you to do mm -hmm. if you're so spiritual? I, I, I'm telling you, people are just making up stuff in their heads. And every little thought, they, what they haven't learned is really how to hear the voice of God. They literally think every thought that comes floating in and out of their head 
is somehow God speaking to them. The Bible says if you want to get, Paul right, if you want to get married, get married. If you don't, then don't. How come Paul the Apostle never one time when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 7th chapter, talking about marriage, ever said, ask God what he wants you to do? How come he doesn't say that? How come you go to 100,000 Christians today, they'll say, well, ask God to tell you what to do. How come in the, even in the Bible, in the New Testament, they don't even talk like this? These are, you know what it is? It's that Ephesus of the Old, Old Testament again. The yeah. Lord telling them something. Look, God hardly ever told anybody about that. If you think you're Samson, I hardly doubt it. All right, see ya! Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle!